looking at our own area, the northwest coast, from northern California to Alaska, and the plateau of the river and the other side of the Cascades, we see the same pattern. Populations are smaller per square kilometer, but here the people on the plateau have, even with their access to salmon, do not have populations on average or median close to that on the coast. This has to do with access to transportation. It also probably has access to resources, but transportation is crucial. And then one last case, we look at the Arctic. Again, coastal people and interior peoples. And here we're talking about, you know, most of them are both between zero and 10 people per hundred square kilometer. We're talking about very small populations, but it's the same pattern. And then I blew that up a little bit. So here's the zero to 10 point. I blew up a little bit, so that was more visible. But again, so the pattern is consistent. So in native North, North America, we see a pattern similar to that of European cities, where people with that consistent access to water transportation have bigger populations than people who don't. Um, so it's, it's crucial. And then this is another painting that I just threw in uh, by Gordon Miller of some people uh, working their way through a pod of killer whales. I think I put that in because I was once on a small boat up in Northern BC and there were killer whales in the harbor. Uh, and I was much relieved that we weren't that close. Okay, so why, why, what is the importance of this transportation? One is you can haul larger stuff than you can on foot. Uh, this is 1911, the uh, push, and in this case they're unloading maybe oatmeal, so it's Columbia outside. Um, traditional canoe, 100 years before that, it would have been a box of, of perhaps uh, sand or something. So pedestrian hunters and gatherers, people have to walk everywhere. Maximum load they can carry is about, they carry is about 33 pounds. You know, they don't have big backpacks and a lot of equipment that we use, so they can't carry them, they don't carry any pounds. And the standard day trip is about four, two and a half to four miles. That's a day, that's round trip. And then a long trip is about 12 to 17 miles in a day. We look at canoes, and these canoes are whaling canoes, actually, at, at uh, we call whaling canoes on the west coast of uh, Washington. Small loads, smallest carry loads up to about 180 pounds. This should be 12,000 pounds, not 12,000 tons, 12 tons. So, so that should be 12,000 pounds. So that's a lot, that's six tons. Um, so that's a lot more than 32 pounds. And they can go farther. Uh, so kind of here's the standard walking distance for a day, two and a half, four miles. Here it's one to two hours. And uh, four to 10 hours, I calculated rates, our red books, and things like that. How fast the canoes go? Uh, about 12 to 17 miles in four to 10 hours, 30 miles in one day. Well, what's important here is not only the long trips, but multiple short trips. But the point I wanted to make with this map, uh, this is Salish territory, Coast Salish territory. Uh, so here are the uh, San Juan Islands, Vancouver's there, Victoria's down here, Victoria's there. And when Lieutenant Vancouver came up through here and is exploring expedition in 1792, he encountered Komach from here going over to Vancouver to fish for salmon. Uh, Fraser salmon runs the most productive north of Columbia. So why does that matter? There are 800 Komach. So Flotilla was the entire Komach nation tribe on their way to go fishing. It's 800 people. So it's a lot of people. Um, and this is in northern British Columbia. A lot of this is from there. Uh, French River Harbor, the Alaskan border. And so this is uh, sort of the short distance circumference. This is the median day trip circumference by canoe. And then this is 60 kilometers. This is a long day's haul. And this actually sort of corresponds with Coast Central Territory. But looking down at the, at the photograph, here's Prince Rupert Harbor. So that short haul is the entire harbor's in that. So that full out, simple fall out here. The, sh the longer distance, median day's distance, takes you out to this set of islands. And then the, the full day strip uh, is out here. There's, a, there's another island out there that's about that distance that shows up on my laptop. It doesn't show here. So this gives you a sense as to what's available in canoes that wouldn't be available in terms of distance or volume of hauling stuff to people on foot. So when we think about 
about the canoes and hauling freight, though, we tend to think perhaps of big water. This is looking across Baker Bay to Astoria. Uh, and, but it's these small placid waters, this is off the river, uh, that may be more important. And going now upstream to Portland, this is an 1890 or 1888 navigational chart. Here's the Columbia, there's the there's Atlanta River, Soviet Island. And the civil areas, which are hard to read because it's so complicated, are all the wetlands. There's a photograph of that same area, here's Sturgeon Lake. And this, all of this would have been accessible in small boats. Just all of it. The resources, transportation, moving people, moving things, getting around, going with relatives, all of those things would have been accessible. You know, now we're on roads and you get off, you know, you need to have your high boots and all those kinds of things to, to deal with this. But 200 years ago, small shovel nose canoe about your know, deep and it's all available. So small loads may be the most important. This young woman is a sailor's woman and she's collecting clams and she's going to put them in her little boat, which is kind of like the one back that we'll be hanging out with next, and taking them home. There's a Lewis and Clark account. The night after the, the night they visited Capitol, they went upstream about a mile and camped, and there's a little lake which is still there. And they observe Chinook and women wading out of the lake and loosening wapto balls. Wapto is a plant or nutrition ball root. Loosening them with their toes, the balls float to the surface. They scoop them up and put them directly into their canoe. When the canoes are filled, they would portage them across to the local little river, like river, which parallels the Columbia, and then take them home. And I always have this vision of actually who's taking them home is a 12 year old. Woman goes back in another canoe, starts filling that up, and hands the canoe to her kid or somebody or an niece or nephew to take that back while I'm doing more. Because a child can manage that canoe. <clears throat> so you have a child moving 150 pounds with the roots while the woman's gathering more roots. Whereas you're not going to have a child carrying 150 pounds of roots over the two miles of, of open ground. They can't manage that kind of weight. So there's all, this, all these efficiencies that come with boats. That if you're on foot, you don't have. So she could be, this could be Wilma Bay, especially if we get rid of the Olympics and back. Imagine the piece of the little bit of hills. And she's filling this up with native oysters. Or get rid of this completely, and the vision knows its roots, and she's waiting to portage her boat across the Lake River to take the cat home. So it's probably these small or she's thinking about, you know, oh my goodness. Um, I want to chuck these, get them out of the shells, fill them up with clam meat, so I'm not having to waste time hauling, you know, not, not hauling all this excess shell. I'm just going to fill this up with baskets of meat and take them home. Uh, and she can do either. Very easy, very simple, whereas on foot, you know, this is not all she'd be able to manage. Then there's trade. We call the Chuck. The Chuck and people of the river are famous traders. So there's a trade port here, one here, and there's a major one in Dallas. This is the major nexus of a trade route that extends through southeast Alaska, down the coast, down the Lennon Valley in Northern California, and east beyond Yellowstone. And stuff moved along the sand, along the snake, along the Columbia to here, and moved up to Columbia. So this is basically at a portage point between river systems and goods flowed upriver. Uh, in canoes. So canoes were central to, to trade, which was a source of much of the wealth of the people who lived here, or among some of the wealthiest in Western North America. And then, of course, when Europeans showed up, the fur trade. One of the things I, I chose this thing because, whoops, these canoes aren't much smaller than that ship. And that's a ship that came in from Boston, but the local canoes aren't much smaller. And this, again, reinforces that point. Except you know, they had cannons, and the Industrial Revolution is underway now on the sailing ship. But again, at some level, in terms of vessels, there are differences, but not, not as dramatic as one might have been. 